Good morning, everyone. Good to see your titles on the screen this morning. You're up early. Morning, Chris. Morning, Kyle. Morning, Matt. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Senator Kathleen. Good to have you with us. Good morning, Chief. Well, Mayor, do you have your uh, headphones working correctly now? Yes, finally. Good. Yep. yep. Good morning, Cameron. Morning, Nate. Morning, Mayor. Cameron, good to see you. Good morning, Mayor. Great to see you. I wish I was seeing you the Bavarian, but uh, maybe next year, right? We hope. We hope, we pray, we get inoculated, and we will. <laughs> Morning, Cameron, are you, are you going to miss the French toast? Or Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and the yeah, pepper absolutely. bacon, and yeah, all that. <laughs> Good morning, yeah, Representative. Keep rubbing it in. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, morning Ashley. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Wish we were all at the Bohemian, but. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Senator? I'm awesome. How are you? Looks like you're up on the slopes today. <laughs> I, I'm out walking my dog. <laughs> okay. Well, we need a dog around these meetings, too. <laughs> Give there him you a go. Say, for us. Say hi, Bo. There you go. Hey, there he is. Yep. <laughs> I kind of like these virtual meetings. I get to walk my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're happy to have all of you with us, too. You may, uh, Mayor, you may have a tough time uh, getting other members of the House this morning. There is an all-day legislator training going on. Uh, I have opted out of it, uh, but I may be one of, the, one of the few that have opted out. So members of the House may be, may be pretty limited on this call. All right. Well, we will, uh, it's 7.30 and, uh, uh, well, there's Representative Benyon. Welcome, good to have you. You're playing hooky too, huh? Hi. It was probably, it's, it's probably a Republican caucus training. Sorry, I should have been a little. Uh, okay. Good morning, Dave. Good to have you with us. Mayor, it's so nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> good morning and everyone else, I'll tell you. You know, the, the last thing I want to see first thing in the morning is the guy in the box next to you on your on your left that I on my on my computer. And that's a cop. That's the last <laughs> thing I want to see first thing in the morning. Sorry, Randy. <laughs> well, what have you been doing there, Dave, that you're afraid to see a cop? Makes me a little curious about your life. Uh, can I just let me just tell you, Senator, you don't know you don't know half of what I do in my personal life. And I'm not going to go into that right now because it would make Ashley blush. I mean, that's why he's a little nervous. I'm so happy to see you here this morning, officer. Uh, Good morning. Kathleen, what are you doing? Are you out running? Are you skiing? What are you, you, you snowshoeing? 
Well, I would divulge my um, location, but we do have an officer on the uh, call, so um, <laughs> that would compromise my my <laughs> clandestine plan. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'm sure you can be found. <laughs> We've got two people watching you in the trees right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep Your dog's it. on leash, right, Kathleen? <laughs> Yes, he is. All right. I'll, I'll, you know, I just want to add this. This is always one of my favorite pre-legislature meetings. And, you know, we've got a couple of new folks today. And Representative Chris, Chris Jansen, nice to see you this morning. I missed the breakfast at, uh, at uh, the Bohemian. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that, Dave. Thank you. I want to welcome, you let's see, we got some... Uh, We've got uh, Council Member Sperry and Representative Stoddard and our City Attorney, Lisa Garner, trying to get her audio working. Uh, who else did I see come on? Uh, Matt Dahl, welcome to you, Assistant City Manager. Good morning. And Brandon, what? Hi, I'm Maddie Wolf. I'm working with the Stoddifors. Oh, okay. Well, great. Good to have you with us. Mayor, let, me, let, me, let us introduce Maddie Wolf. Okay. And, and it's Maddie Wolf Carlson. And she was a legislative intern last year and did a great job. We worked with her on a couple of bills. She worked with uh, Representative Carol Spackman Moss. And we, we, got to know, we got to know Maddie quite well on a couple of the bills that, that we worked with, uh, with Carol for police chiefs and, and holiday. And we were impressed by Maddie. She, uh, she graduated from Utah State this last spring. Uh, she's getting ready to apply to law school. And she's in the middle of applications and, and interviews. And, uh, you know, with, with everything that's going on and with the fact that we want to have enhanced communication, you know, between, you know, uh, you and the council and, and, and the administration and the legislators, you know, Maddie's overseeing all of our communications and some of our research and, and making sure that this old man doesn't forget to, to, to do what I need to do in the morning. And so we're very, very pleased to have Maddie. Now it'll say Brandon on there, but my guess is it's, it's, uh, it's her husband's account or husband's computer. So, so we'll forgive her for trying to hide under a seven foot frame. <laughs> and Cameron, just so you know, I don't know if you know, because I know you're a big you. Uh, yeah, we, I know. You know what we, you know, we've got, we have a, personal access to the Utah basketball team now through Maddie. Uh, there yeah, are Maddie's Maddie, name up there now, so we can read it. All right. Maddie, we'll you may you right. may not realize this, but you were a very famous intern last year uh, because of your husband. So you'll continue to be famous this year. Because of the spatophores. <laughs> <laughs> we're infamous, Dave. It's infamous. I think she was famous because she was awesome. That's why I think she was famous. And she worked with Carol Spackman Moss. Agreed. Well, working with Carol gives her an extra award. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and Ashley determined that Maddie would be the best one to hire because if she could work with Carol last year, she certainly could work with me this year. So, you know, so, <laughs> so that, that was the overarching figure that Ashley said, it's got to be Maddie. <laughs> Well, I just want to uh, welcome everybody and uh, go through introductions. I'll just do it in the order it's on my screen, and uh, we'll, we'll get to everybody that way. I want to welcome uh, Chris Butte, who's our Economic Development Director in Midvale. Uh, I'm Good morning. Ron, the mayor of Midvale City. And the next one I see is Chief Randy Thomas of Unified Police Department. He's over the Midvale Precinct that services Midvale. White City and the, uh, the the Granite community, I think, is the other one. Is it not? Uh, several other communities, but all unincorporated. Yeah. Okay. Our city manager, Kane Loader, is next on my screen. Welcome, Kane. Ashley Spatafor is the uh, uh, female member of the duo of Spatafors that take care of our uh, legislators and make sure that. Uh, things such as this today, and you'll be hearing a lot from Ashley and her, her father, Dave. Uh, and so we welcome you, Ashley. I've got Cameron Deal, the uh, executive director of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. 
is next. Steve Christiansen is a representative that serves the west side of Midvale. Uh, Galen Benyon is next. Galen, I don't remember what district you're over, but you're part of Midvale, and I apologize for not knowing that specific. I'm House District 46, so we only cover that very um, eastern part of Midvale. Oh, I'm probably living in it then. So good. 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 I welcome you. Yeah. Uh, Dave Spadafore is next on my screen. So welcome, Dave. And his uh, aide, Maddie Wolf Carlson. I can call you by name now, Maddie. Welcome to you. Uh, Lisa Garner is our city attorney. Welcome, Lisa. Rory is our, our city recorder. And uh, welcome to you. Nate Rockwood is our economic development director. Uh, no. Community Development Director, got to get that right. We welcome you. Kyle Marr is our Administrative Services Director. Matt Dahl is our Assistant City Manager. Welcome, Matt. Uh, Brad, Brad Larson is the uh, Fire Chief that we re report to, and he reports to us from Unified Fire Authority. Welcome this morning, Chief Larson. I've got uh, Kathleen Reby, our Senator. Uh, is on the uh, path out there with her dog. Matt Pierce, who's our uh, IT director, he's making sure all of this is working this morning. Welcome, Matt. Uh, Glenn Kennedy is our uh, public works director. Welcome. You got your team, I know, at this hour of the morning, you're working hard. Uh, yeah. Laura Magnus is our PIO, public information officer at Midvale City. She's joined us. We have City Council Member Quinn Sperry. Welcome, Quinn. Good to have you up at this hour. Oh, you're out on the beach. I'm sorry to interrupt this. <laughs> and uh, we have Andrew Stoddard, who is also a representative that represents uh, the center of our city. So welcome to all of you. Um, I think I got my whole screen covered, so I... That's everybody. Welcome to you. We'll we'll start right up next with uh, legislative issues. Is that what we decided, uh, Christopher Butte? I think you're up first at bat. So, would you go over what you have? Well, usually I open by saying welcome to Midville, and then asking you to indulge in some French toast at the Bohemian. But obviously, we're not doing that today. Welcome to Midville, theoretically. Um, as Economic Development Director, we have some important subjects to talk about or a lot of great things happening in Midville. Um, in general, we have a, several hundred million dollars being invested in our city right now. And many of them have come through different avenues and direction. Uh, the Canyon School District is spending well over $100 million with school improvements. The most notable that's still under construction is Hillcrest High School on 900 East. Uh, we're just seeing the completion and the wind down of the I-15 southbound corridor. And we're also experiencing the northbound improvements on the I-15 corridor. The southbound, as many of you can finally, finally, experience is the improvement in the widening of 7200 south from I-15 into one of our super fun redevelopment sites with Top Golf and the View 72 Corporate Center, which includes about 8,000 8, new residents to our city in the recent years and about 6,000 employees. And it connects the Beanham Junction, which goes south into our next development that we're working through called View 78. And at View 78, one of those projects that we have underway and under construction is uh, Zion's Technology Center, which is well over a $160 million project. We've got several uh, hundred units that are built and 80% of them are currently occupied with Wasatch communities that's through townhomes and uh, density residential. And then we have some infrastructure going in and we have some future um, projects that we'll be announcing shortly. 
Um, as well as that, we have a lot of infield development going on and a lot of redevelopment activities related to the, the shops at Fort Union in the Fort Union area. Um, the mayor can attest or complain, or I don't know how you would explain it, but just basically 150 yards away from the mayor's house, we have Kitty Corner from Hillcrest High School. Uh, one of the projects that's going forth, and it's a six story basic multifamily residential with ground floor retail on 900 East Kitty Corner from the entry to Hillcrest High School. So we're pretty excited about a lot of the activities. We have a lot of new retail coming online and uh, we're, we're, we seem to be surviving the, the coronavirus fairly well and look forward to uh, seeing it over to be frank. But uh, as of this morning, uh, we're gonna be rolling, I mean, there's all the financial institutions in Utah are starting to roll out the next wave of PPP and they call it PPP 2.0. And so uh, that's a, another effort that we're fully engaged with to help our small businesses and uh, retailers. That's all I have to say. That's economic development in Midville. Uh, Chris, you, can you Chris. just take an extra second or two and talk about how successful we have been on, on, on all the development west of the city, you know, that, we, that used to be the old Superfund site, you know, and what and how Midville turned, you know, that, that nothingness into, you know, roughly how much of an economic development impact, not just for Midville, but for the entire state. I think that's important because I know Representative Benyon, Representative Christiansen, have, I don't think they've heard, got that information. And I think it'd be important to share that with them. Yeah, so west of the freeway is also been designated in recent years as an opportunity zone. But beyond that, what Dave Spadafore is talking about is we've developed uh, two different, and, and both these sites, Beenham Junction and Jordan Bluffs, comprise 20% of the landmass of Midville. And this is important and as a reference point, when you think of Midville, that 20% of Midville used to be basically off the table. Uh, and in, in the case of Jordan Bluffs, we had a 265 acre development that basically was a prior Superfund site with a fence around it. So in other words, those sites were basically 20% of Midville was like off limits for all intents and purposes. The development that's occurred west of there, um, specifically in Beenham Junction, which is a showcase for the EPA, uh, we've, we've got company headquarters for Overstock.com, uh, CHT, Zag, Savage. Um, Marriott International has a presence there for the vacation stuff. And then uh, we've got some additional growth going on to the south. But we're talking about stuff that's gain recognition through uh, the University of Utah Cam Gardner School. There's a study that was done that showed how much growth it was. And now we're working on the south side, which comprises of the Zions Bank is the first commercial project we have going into that site. Um, that's gonna be 400,000 square feet. Um, it'll be the second, you know, Zions Bank, what most people don't realize and what we, we hope to capture as part of the Silicon Slopes that will become the, lar the second largest employer of technology people in the state of Utah. And it will all be focused in Midville. We anticipate that coming online and being open in about two years. It's a, it's a really innovative project in that it's, uh, it's gonna house up to about 2000 employees and it will, they're shooting for platinum lead certification, which means that the design qualities will be top notch and involves solar and stuff of that nature. We've also added additional residential and we have the capacity with the Gardner company to do another million plus square feet of office. But all that office that you're, we're talking about and what I think Spadafore is indicating is that we've created in, in our city and the Western side specifically, well over 7,000 jobs when this, you know, and, and when this comes online, it'll be more than that. And these are jobs that are paying two and a half times the average. And a lot of them 
and we're, we're a big player in creating those jobs that are tied into Silicon slope. So these are the ones that are, you know, dramatically impacting the labor market in Utah and creating jobs that help all of us move forward. And we're, the other thing I forgot to say is the city, these two sites are on the Western site. One of the streets just in from there on Main Street is an area that the city is really focused in on. Um, and our RDA is full, in full capacity of getting tax entities to participate in the CDA there to help us renovate and redevelop our Main Street area, historic Midville, if you will, and see that take the shape that it deserves. It has a great infrastructure and there's a lot of changes that have already occurred, but we just see that continuing to build and we're excited. Yeah, and I'd recommend that uh, anybody needs to drive around uh, Main Street in Midvale because you'll have a, oh yeah, I remember it when moment about five years from now. So uh, take advantage of our little city here. It's, it's really gonna be changing a lot. Uh, the next item, thank you, Chris Butte, that was very good. Can I interject for a second? I, I just yeah. want to share how exciting that is that that RDA has worked out so well. Um, I know that we have a partnership with our cities and our schools and um, GOMB has worked really hard to create these partnerships with RDAs. And so um, I'm just so excited that there's 7,000 jobs. When you describe that progress, I was on the state school board and we signed that RDA, I think four years ago. So this just makes me so excited to hear how well this is all working out. So thank you for sharing all the details about that RDA. Good comment, Senator. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is the homelessness funding and impacts. Uh, Spatifors, do you wanna help kick in here and give us an overview of what's going on? Mayor, I think we were going to uh, have uh, uh, Cameron take some time up front and okay. talk about uh, the legislative issues for the league. All right, thank you. We'll shift over to Cameron for legislative issues. Terrific, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you legislators in advance for your service and sacrifice over the next couple of months. Uh, Midvale has always had a special place in my heart. My late grandmother was a longtime Midvale resident. Uh, Mayor Seguini was like a third grandmother to me. And I think Chris's presentation really demonstrates the power of local decision-making and the ability of local officials to have a vision and execute it and work together with different stakeholders. And really the reason the Utah League of Cities and Towns exists is to advocate for cities across the state to have the authority they need to make these types of, frankly, history altering decisions for their communities. Uh, the league advocates at the legislature based on three key principles, respect, collaboration, and outcomes. We urge the legislature to respect the role of local government, just like we respect the role of state government. And ultimately, we want to collaborate together. We want to work together and focus on outcomes. And those outcomes really are summarized by quality of life. State leaders and local leaders are all in the quality of life business. So let's work together to ensure that quality of life. There are many examples, Chris mentioned some, where the legislature, state leaders, county leaders, school district leaders, and city leaders are able to work together to, to enhance that quality of life. I've been at the league since 2006. And unfortunately, over the course of my career, while we've seen many partnership related bills and efforts, we've also been seeing a growing number of bills that would interfere or preempt the ability of cities to make decisions in their traditional roles. In fact, on the agenda today, you'll see several bills that we're working closely on uh, that are of concern, not just to Midvale City, but to cities across the state. Whether that is the ability of cities to plan their communities, uh, planning around transportation and, and housing, whether that's the administrative function of cities and uh, how cities manage their business, whether that's the health, safety, and welfare responsibilities that cities have according to the constitution and state law and efforts to undermine the ability of cities to protect the health, safety, and welfare of their communities. Uh, we are seeing a growing number of those types of issues. Uh, they, they are in the housing space, they're in the billboard space, 
uh, they're in the utility space. And, and so part of my overarching message to you as legislators is to listen to your Midvale city leaders, work with us to, to make sure that we're respecting the role of local government. We'll go into some specific details here in a moment, but I wanted to give you that and that overarching philosophy, because we, we firmly believe the government closest to the people governs best and that working together, we can achieve great things. So when we see these bills that interfere with the traditional role of local government, part of our job at the league is to raise the alarm, try to understand what the, bill, the problem the bill is trying to solve and make sure that the bill ultimately respects the roles of, of each level of government. One other thing that I'll add is that over the last few months, the league has been an active participant in the dialogue around trust in police. Back in June, uh, we put together a task force where we brought together leadership of the Chiefs of Police Association, mayors, council members, city managers, and city attorneys to provide a local perspective on bills in the general category of police reform, but really bills that impacted community trust in police. We commissioned a statewide survey. Uh, we made sure to oversample within that survey of uh, people of color in our community. Uh, we interviewed a couple of hundred police officers from around the state to get their perspective. So we've really been looking to find that balance between supporting officers and identifying areas of potential improvement that will enhance community trust in police. Because after all, local governments are responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of their community, safety being a critical component of what we do. So as we get into the legislative session and you're looking at bills that impact how local governments plan their communities or housing or law enforcement. Uh, we urge you to use me as a resource, use the Spatifors as a resource, and most importantly, use Mayor Hale, Kane, Matt, uh, and Quinn, and the rest of the team in Midvale City uh, so that you're aware of what those potential ramifications and consequences could be on your community. With that, Merit, I wanted to just give that overarching uh, perspective, and uh, we can now get into the specific details of the bills. I've been involved in every bill that's that's on the agenda. Uh, so I'll chime in if necessary, but I'll give the time back to you unless there are any questions from your delegation. Questions for Cameron? All right, I see Representative Elison is chiming in. Welcome, Representative Elison. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning to you. Our next subject then, uh, if I'm on the same agenda, is uh, to discuss homelessness funding and impacts. And Representative Elison, you're getting with us just in time. So Spatiforce, do you wanna begin with that? And uh, let's work, the, work through this complicated yet very sensitive social issue. Uh, Mayor, thank you very much. I think, I think Matt, you, Matt was gonna- no, I was going to. I was going to. I was going to. I was going to thank the mayor and then turn it to you. Oh, yeah, gotcha. you, you ruined my segue. I apologize. I should have known. Um, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. I um, have had an opportunity to work with uh, a couple different groups this year um, on uh, several different bills. I'm a part of the uh, Commission on Housing Affordability, and. Um, the more involved I am with the legislature in each year, I see just how difficult your jobs are. And I think just given uh, COVID and the current uh, political climate nationally and all those things, I mean, your job is just that much harder this year. And so appreciate you giving us your time and, um, and I wish uh, you the, the, uh, a good session. And I think we'll be able to do some good things together. Now, um, as far as the resource centers uh, go, um, you know, Midvale has had a family resource center for a long period of time. And uh, we really think of that resource center as being part of our community. And we appreciate having a role in helping those who are experiencing homelessness and finding a way to help them uh, uh, improve their lives, uh, find some stability. And because of that, you know, we also are a home to a lot of uh, service providers that uh, provide services to those experiencing homelessness. And so, um, you know, we put a lot of our effort, uh, time and financial resources into working with that population. And um, it's, it's no surprise that that's a vulnerable population that does attract crime. 
And uh, when the homeless shelter first became a permanent shelter, uh, we footed a large part of the bill, but over time the state has found ways to contribute um, to the public safety component of what we do at the resource center um, to the tune of, 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 of a significant amount of money. Now, um, what we've been seeing out of the fund that we receive there that funds uh, nine police officers is that um, it's been a huge success and that uh, we have seen um, some stabilization as far as some of the crime that occurs around the homeless center. Now, um, it's important to note that all a huge portion of that area that uh, Chris talked about earlier is adjacent to that homeless shelter. And so um, the benefit to both our community, the region and the state that comes out of that area is impacted uh, by those people that, that prey on those experiencing homelessness. And so the, the, the uh, law enforcement present, presence there, public safety presence there is extremely important. What we've been seeing, though, is over the last couple of years, the funding that we've received from the state has been declining, while the need has not been declining. And so um, in this most recent allocation, we, uh, there was a decline in about $300,000 in what we were receiving to cover public safety. And that's money that Midvale and Midvale residents are going to have to uh, come up with uh, through our taxes and fees and what, or taxes in order to cover that. And so uh, we have a resource center that is serving the state, um, but our community is having to come up with additional resources because of that declining source from the state. And that's a big concern for us because we're not a, we're not a big city. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have one of the lower uh, home values in the state, um, which means that the amount of property tax revenues and things that we're generating are not as great as some other communities around us. And so every time there's a decline in those resources, it's a big hit for us. So this is something that we think is, is really important, but it, it's also important that we're not trying to say that we're want to get rid of the homeless shelter or, or uh, anything like that. We think it is a part of our community. We just hope that uh, for something that provides services to the state that we will be able to continue and we appreciate the resources we have received, but that we can continue to be supported um, uh, at that local level as we try to address some of those concerns. Um, additionally, I also wanted to cover- um, Can I ask here. you a question? Please. Sorry, uh, this is uh, Steve Ellison. Um, this $300,000 decline in uh, funding, to my knowledge, the legislature didn't, didn't cut the funding. I could be wrong, but was this re-diverted elsewhere and, and do you know why? I'm just wondering if you have a little yeah. bit more background on that because that's troubling sure. to hear. Yeah, um, so the, um, there's a few things that are, that are causing that decline. One of them is that, uh, so when the fund was originally set up a few years ago, um, the intent is that we would be uh, bringing in a portion of, of sales tax collected by communities throughout the state. That would go into a centralized fund and it would be distributed originally to the communities that had resource centers um, with Midvale and South Salt Lake um, and Salt Lake being, being beneficiaries of that. Um, subsequent to that though, there have been other communities that have uh, indicated that they are, uh, have homeless shelter, um, have a version of homeless shelters in their communities. Um, and that then has sort of diluted the total amount of money that are in, is in that pool. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate every effort that communities give in order to uh, support those experiencing homelessness. I think that if we looked at those different sheltering facilities, though, I mean, one of my concerns is that um, some of them are different than uh, the resource centers that we provide. And so, you know, may how I, may access to those funds is... is may, may I be yeah. a little bit more specific? Please. Uh, Steve, that's a great question, and it's and, and you're right. The legislature did not have right. any act, act activity in this. Uh, and by the way, I was I was going to also say earlier that you, you had told me that you would be on the on the call a little bit late because you have other conflicts. So we appreciate you finding time to be with us. Thank you. When we started the fund, uh, it was it was and, and you were the house sponsor, as you recall. You know the, the 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 percentage that we put into that bill was just a shot in the dark, and and. You know, we were we uh, Midvale and South Salt Lake were swimming upstream because at that point in time, 
the league was opposed to it. Sorry, Cameron, because you, a, a lot of your other members did not want to participate into the fund. But President no, Niederhauer fact, facts and, are facts. <laughs> and Speaker Hughes, you know, were were very were very adamant that, that everybody participate, and and you you know were terrific on that. Because no one, because very few supported us, we could not get adequate de detail out of the tax commission as to exactly how much money we needed. Ashley and I just did on on the back of a napkin with Midvale and South Salt Lake try to figure out what percentage off the top of the population distribution we needed for everyone to participate. Because as we all remember, Speaker Hughes and President Niederhauser said, Homeless, it, homelessness is a statewide issue. And that's why we looked at the fund of the population distribution so everybody could contribute. So we picked a percentage and we thought that that percentage was gonna equal about between five and a half and $6 million a year. Uh, Midville was supposed to get a, a base of 20% of that. South Salt Lake was supposed to get a base of 40% of that. Now these, as you know, Steve, these are the two biggest shelters. And, and so what's happened since then is that back of the napkin calculation did not get the five and a half to six million. It got barely five. So we were, we were, we were off about 15%, 16%. Then since that time, Vernal has a small shelter. Richfield has a small shelter. So legislation has been done uh, uh, legislation has been done to uh, uh, prevent, to, to preclude those guys, uh, those guys from getting, um, to, from contributing to the fund. So that dropped the fund down less. The, uh, in order, uh, the CAM and the league fought to put a ceiling on the amounts of $200,000. And so as West Valley and Provo and others have hitting that ceiling, they're not, you know, they're contributing to 200,000, but that's not adding that's not adding to the overall fund. And, and, then, and then what's happened since is, 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 is the Statewide Homeless Coordinating Committee in its efforts to support everybody, there were the two grants as you remember, the initial grant that, that, go, that a minimum of 40% goes to South Salt Lake, 20% goes to, goes to uh, Midvale. Then everything else was a secondary grant. And what the Homeless Coordinating Committee under, under Social Services has done is they have absolutely said to South Salt Lake that 40% now is your base, is your ceiling. And Midville, that 20% is your ceiling. So not only has the overall amount gone down, the, the Statewide Homeless Coordinating Committee, because Ogden, quite frankly, has come in, has come in to, to and, and they're, getting, they're getting almost as much, if not more than Midville right now on their requests. No offense to Ogden, but Ogden, Ogden has, is a bigger city than Midvale. Ogden has a better tax base than Midvale. And, and so that is an issue. So what's happened, Steve, is DWS in their, in their recommendations on grants have internally taken that base of 40 and 20 to make it the ceiling of 40 and 20. And then Ogden and St. And George primarily have gotten funding. So less money, and, and then less internal workings. That's, that's where we are, Steve. And it's become a problem because now, uh, uh, the other day, uh, Ashley and I were on a meeting with the chamber and Provo was saying they don't want to pay into the fund anymore either. Cameron, uh, Dave, that's I, I know very helpful. Uh, uh, th th thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I, I don't want to take more than my fair share of time. I know this is a critical issue though for the city. I, I'm wondering if Cameron, uh, just knowing his background with this and uh, knowing you know recent developments, Cameron, do you have any recommendations of how we help remedy this situation for cities like uh, Midville that have been good players all along and now are actually I, you know kind of suffering the <laughs> the consequences of the proverbial no good deed goes unpunished. If I had a suggestion. Right. If I had to say before Cameron speaks, because Cameron's going to, Cameron is going to take the, the uh, look at the, Cameron has a tough decision because he has cities who have shelters, cities who don't have shelters, and, and those are all factors. If I had to make, if I had to make a recommendation, see what I would do 
is I would, I would take a look at what Midvale and South Salt Lake have been given in the past and what, been, what their reductions are and see if they need to have an increase. I know Midvale is shy 300,000, which is about an officer and a half, I believe. Just, just this year. Just this year. So we're, you know. It's been declining for several years. Yeah. So anyway, years. what I would do is I would take a look at what Midvale and South Salt Lake has, is not getting that they should be getting, or that they thought they were going to get with the initial acquisition. And then if we have to bump that percentage up uh, statewide, you know, if I think it's 1.89 or something like that now. If we've got to go up to 1.92 or 1.93, or 1.94, then everybody still contributes to the fund. That's what I would do. Thank you. What so do you rep think, yeah, Representative Ellison, I, I don't want to take over the, the entire meeting, but I think there are some there are some key points for a larger policy discussion. Uh, a couple of quick points of clarification. Uh, the Vernal Shelter, just closed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we're, whereas Vernal zeroed out under Representative Chu's bill last year, they will be paying back into the fund this coming year. Uh, Provo City has repeatedly, since you passed your bill several years ago, has tried to make the argument that they should zero out, but the different facilities that are in Provo City do not meet the definition that, that's in the bill. Uh, so they, so they keep make, making that argument, but it, it doesn't qualify. And if you, if we were to have this call in Ogden City, St. George City, South Salt Lake, and Salt Lake, the four other cities that hold that house homeless resource centers, they would all also be able to talk about the the in, impacts on public safety in their communities and on the budgets in their cities. I think it's important as we modernize the homelessness governance structure. And you'll be running that bill from the Garden Falls Institute. You and I spent a lot of time this summer on that structure that we, that we ensure that data is driving the discussion of how to spend dollars. Uh, I was on a call with Speaker Wilson, today's Wednesday, so two days ago now with my officers and we were talking about homelessness. And Speaker Wilson expressed frustration that he felt like every year we were trying to refix the policy. And our officers, which currently include mayors of Mill Creek, who just uh, recently uh, accepted a, a winter overflow shelter site, uh, the mayor of Ogden, mayor of South Jordan, council member in Spanish Fork, and the city manager of Bountiful, all agreed that as we modernize this governance structure, we should get better data, better recommendations from these local homelessness coordinating committees, and a better understanding of the full scope of the public safety impact on the communities that are housing shelters, as well as getting a better understanding of what secondary facilities there are throughout our community that also may have public safety impacts, but not to the same degree that you have in Midville and South Salt Lake. So I think before we immediately jump to, we should start changing the calculation here and there, I think we, we need to let data drive the conversation. Data will help cities like a Sandy that don't have an emergency resource center, but have a neighboring city who does, data will help Sandy recognize the impact on Midvale City and be more likely to contribute more dollars if that's the, if that's the ultimate outcome. Just like data will help Midvale City, now that we're several years into this, be able to say, here's what the actual need is, not just the predicted need, and so how do we work together to meet that need? So rather than putting an exact outcome on the table for you, I think your bill on modernizing the structure and making sure we have the right voices in the room and the right people around the table will help. The data will help. And then you figure out the revenue streams so that not just Midville, but the other cities that are housing shelters and seeing these impacts have sufficient revenue and everybody is contributing to the overall solution. Um, okay, th th thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Can I make a, a request of you? Always. Um, I, I, I look, I'm all about data. We, we get what we measure, we fix what we measure, we are what we measure, and if it's not measured, it doesn't matter. Um, however, um, I don't want to delay any policy decisions this session, you know, a few days away from the beginning of this session because there's a new request for data. 
So if you could email me specifically what data you're looking for, I don't want, I, I'm not saying you are, but I, I, I've seen it before. I just want to make sure data is not used as an excuse to say, well, we know we need to do this, but we need the data first. I mean, we, we've been talking like you and I as part of this uh, Gardner Center group all summer. And so if there's, if, you know, if, if there's this belief that we, we critically need data at this juncture to make any policy decisions, please let me know specifically what that data is and where we should get it from. I just, I just want to make sure that doesn't um, slow down or sidetrack the unique opportunity we have this session to make hopefully some, you know, important policy changes so we don't have to keep revisiting this issue. So ho hopefully that's a fair request. Yep, I, I think that's an absolutely fair request. And I can coordinate with not just Midville, but the other homeless resource center cities as we get into the session and are working on your bill. We, uh, you know, we can't, we Matt, before, I'll let you go, but let me just say this, uh, Representative Ellison, based on the reports that both Midvale and South Salt Lake have to provide to DWS, we have all of the data based on the work of, of the nine officers in Midvale, the 12 in South Salt Lake, and, and, and how we have, how working with the road home in both instances, we've done a, a better job of containing the, the, the criminal activity from getting into the neighborhoods. Because that was one of Mur Murray's concerns years ago was that you know, they were having an impact too. The policing, the, for the administrative changes the road home has made have been terrific. The road home and Midvale, the road home and South Salt Lake have become terrific partners. You know, the monthly meetings that we have in both cities have proven very valuable in making sure that everybody feels better. In South Salt Lake right now, because of all the new calls, some of the neighborhoods that have the residential neighbors to the South are finding huge impacts. You know, one of the issues that have happened is is with is a lot of the a lot of the offenders in South Salt Lake are taken to the jail and released because of some of the changes we've made in the legislature on 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 on, on no on no jail time and releasing before they see a magistrate. That's become a factor. But what we have right now though is we have all the we have all the data, and 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 for example in Midvale we either have to eliminate two officers you know, which could impact the 700 South Corridor or around the center or Midvale City residents are, gonna, are going to be subsidizing the state. So I think the data that we have is solid and is there and we could have it to you. We could have it to you uh, before the week's out. Uh, th thank you. And now I'm gonna ask this question. This is gonna be a uh, rhetorical question, but has the council considered officially designating the Midtown Suite as a homeless facility so they could qualify for additional funding for the law enforcement uh, needs around that facility. That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that. Well, under the statute, under the statute, they wouldn't have that option because the, the, the statute only calls for the, uh, the, 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 the beds at, at the shelters that we, that are now. Not, not I, 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 I know. I, I'm just saying that we, we all know that there are significant law enforcement needs being driven by that facility, which is occupied, you know, uh, I'd say a significant percentage of their residents are homeless. Obviously but, kind of maybe just one step above people in the shelter, but you know, anyway, okay. you know, and thank you, Dave, for that, the, getting me that data. Thank you, Cameron. You know, like to look together, work together to try to, you know, tr try to keep the promises made to Midvale and South Salt Lake and those other cities. You know, Steve, one of the one of the things that you could do better than us, quite frankly, is to make a request to the tax commission to see what it would take to ch that percentage change to go to add an extra million dollars to Dave, that fund. Here, here, Dave, I'll I'll just expedite this. Please forward me the request to my legislative email, and it will be forwarded to Commissioner Valentine. I will I will do that when we're done here. Thank you, Steve. And 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 and, and if and if it was a, a request, you know, from the mayor and or the council, that would be even even more helpful because I can say that, you know, the elected official in the city I represent are looking for this information. So please please supply that to me. Thank you. So. That'll be an email. Thank you. Matt, I'm sorry to step over you. No, no, you're fine. And I, I just uh, for the sake of, uh, I might just uh, be, be.
beating the horse for a second here, but uh, the dead horse, but uh, we, um, uh, Representative Elis, and you bring up a really good point about the, the hotels that are on 7200 South. And what I was going to say is I was going to bring up the series of sort of unfortunate articles that came out at the end of last year that kept sort of saying, um, you know, Midvale doesn't want a winter overflow flow shelter in its, in its community. And we were really frustrated by that article for a few those, reasons. Those, those were unfortunate articles indeed. It was unfortunate that somebody even suggested that Midvale bear more than the disproportionate, you know, yeah. share of, uh, you know, duty that they're already bearing. I, I'll, I'll just second that motion. Okay. And, and, and I, I really appreciate it. And, and exactly. That's it. And I wish that it would also have listed all the communities that don't have any shelters or overflow shelters or anything like that. So that's all I wanted to say on that. So I appreciate yeah, the, 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 author lived, the author lived in one of those cities. So I oh, was oh, sorry. I didn't say that. <laughs> I'd like to echo that because I think Midvale has done an incredible job. They have literally done everything right. And uh, as I sit on those homeless committee meetings, I can't begin to tell you how many great things are happening. And so it is unfortunate that we're being held up as not doing a good job when we've actually done a tremendous job. So I echo those concerns and I echo those um, accolades. Thank you. I. Um... I think most of the other stuff I was going to cover was what was covered one way or another during that discussion. So um, I appreciate your support, your kind words. And Mayor, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Okay. I think then we can move on from that to sort of discussing the other legislative items. Uh, let's, uh, if you want to do that, that'd be great. Okay. Let's do okay. that. Oh, sorry. There Thanks you are. for that uh, extended conversation on uh, an issue that is dear to our heart here in Midvale. Thank you to all. Our next issue is medical respite care pilot program. Mayor, do you, want, do you want me to handle that? If you would, please, Dave. Thanks. Uh, I believe this is uh, I believe this is a bill that Representative Dunnigan is sponsoring, and this is a this is a very very important bill for any city that has a homeless shelter, because what it does is it is it uh, works with the with the uh, Department of Health and the homeless shelters to to make sure that uh, uh, that to to get a Medicaid waiver to uh, have cover insurance coverage for those folks who reside at the shelters. So we would support that bill uh, strong, strenuously. I'm gonna to try to do these quickly, Mayor, because we've taken a lot of time already. So we'll go quick and, and, and then we can get any comments from legislators if we need to, if they have anything. That sounds good. Dave, do you want to do you want to take over because we're kind of going over yep. some of these? We're I'll, not going to go, go over. Mayor, I'll go yeah, down the I'll, list. Yeah, what you're going to list as well as what we'll say is we're going to go over some high priority bills that have already been numbered, just to kind of give you a heads up of, of what's on 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 our radar, where our concerns lie, and kind of the direction we want to take for the session. Uh, I'll just throw out there also that this year, just like we've done in the past, we're going to be uh, sending our our bill list to the city every Thursday, and this is what Maddie's gonna really take over because we've got so many bills and it's gonna be so hard. We wanna make sure that the legislators have all of the information that, that you need for our for what our priorities are. So every week we're gonna, Dave and Maddie and I are gonna send a list to the city. They're gonna go over the bills, see what our priorities are. We're gonna put positions on them. And then every beginning of the week, we're gonna try to get you an updated bill file list. So you guys, legislators have everything that's on our minds and, and where, where we stand on the, on, the, on the bills. And then, you know, we'll try to keep it brief and, and succinct. And so we'll have all of our information on there. If you have additional questions, reach out. Um, you know, obviously this, this, um, this session is going to be different as far as communication goes. And so, Dave, you know, we might be up there sometimes, but a lot of times it's going to be text and things like that. So however we want to, or you suggest to, to better improve the communications, you just let us know. But uh, I'll let Dave take over on some of these really high priority bills that we just want to get on your radar. Dave? Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you, Ashley. What we'll do is, is uh, 
let's let's do it. We'll, we'll do these rather quickly, uh, and then if anyone has any questions, we'd we'd love to we'd love to uh, answer those. And if we need to provide more information down the road, we'd be happy to. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a, a couple of them due to time. Uh, House Bill 66 is a bill that's sponsored by Representative Casey Snyder. It's sheriff's amendments, and to our knowledge, we uh, to our knowledge. The sheriffs did not ask for this bill, but what this bill does is in times of riot, civil disobedience, or public uh, uh, public disruption, uh, the county sheriff, if, if, if he or she disagrees with a police chief, can supersede the chief and become the primary law enforcement officer. Now, we're smart enough to know that this is a direct result and, 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 and a hit at Salt Lake City. We know that. And, and, and we're not going to shy away from that fact. However, what that does is that, that, tr that creates a tremendous disruption of, of, of administration over situations like that. Uh, you know, who calls the shots? Who do the officers respond to? Is the sheriff coming in and administering over the local PD? Is the sheriff bringing in their deputies? You know, what, you know, what all of those situations exist? What's going to happen to the rest of the communities? You know, we've had a policy in this state where the, where the sheriff is the law enforcement officer in the county. However, the police chief is the primary law enforcement officer in, a municip in the municipality. When the sheriff comes in, when the sheriff comes in, uh, when the sheriff comes in, the mayor and the mayor and city council lose their administrative authority. And they are the elected officials of that community. You know, unfortunately, we know where this is coming from, but we just believe it, it, it would be a tremendous breach of administrative responsibility. And we're very, very concerned about that. And strongly oppose the bill. See, Ashley speaks in less words than I do. Cameron, uh, uh, Cameron, as you represent other, other uh, cities and towns, what is your perspective on this bill? It, I'm assuming it's similar to what we've just heard. Yep, exactly similar. We've heard from both our police chiefs as well as elected officials who are very concerned about what this means for the chain of command. So yes, we're opposed to the bill. Now, uh, I, wanna, I wanna put it out there. The sheriffs did not ask for the bill. I know that. Uh, I was I was in the office a, a couple a month ago of Sheriff uh, Chad Jensen from Cache County, and he's the sheriff's president. And Casey Snyder represents a district within his his county, and he said we didn't ask for it. Casey wants to run it, and he he told us point blank. He said some sheriffs will support it. So we know that we know that issue. Uh, the next bill I want to bring up, and these are all in numerical order is House Bill 82. And, and this is a bill that deals with ADUs and, and uh, state policy on ADUs. ADUs for, for, uh, for, for legislators, uh, for the new legislators or others who may not know what the, those three letters mean, it's an accessory dwelling unit. And, it, and, that, and that ADU can be internal in a building <clears throat> or it can be external in a secondary building. You know, for example, a, a, a cabana, and if, if, if somebody's on a, in a big lot, it could be outside. If, it's, if there's a detached garage, it could be above the garage. Um, but anyway, anyway, that, that Ray Ward is doing a good thing in running a bill because he is bringing up notice to, a, to the importance of ADUs to help us with affordable housing issues. We're concerned, we're, you know, we, 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 Ray, Representative Ward has worked with us hand in hand you know, and, and we're getting down to some issues that may be policy differences. And I'm gonna let Cameron talk in a second, but, but those policy differences primarily are, you know, is the state overreaching into municipality? That's our concern. You know, we realize that a number of cities have chosen ADUs to be one of their uh, more moderate housing options. And we also understand that some cities may have May, some may view what cities are doing as putting up a block a blockade to that. And that's where the state, that's where 82 is coming in. But what we want to do is we want to work to make sure the policy is, is, is terrific and, and is totally positive. Parking is an issue. You know, we need to make sure that if you have an ADU on your property, 
that you're not you're not infringing on your neighbors also rights to make sure there's adequate off street parking, particularly in the winter when snow plows are operating. We also want to make sure that those <laughs> ABUs are not becoming uh, bed and breakfasts, you know, so that so the owner the owner has to occupy the building. So there are some things that we need to do. Cameron, why don't you take another minute or two and talk about that? I applaud Representative Ward for his willingness to try to find common ground on this one. Uh, that's, that's not always the case. Uh, in, I think the parking is a perfect example of what I was discussing when I Put the, gave you the full overview of the states, the potential tension between the role of state government and the role of local government. The state has an interest in ensuring that there is, that the market is able to provide sufficient housing for residents. Cities have an interest in making sure we're planning for the market to be able to provide housing. One potential tool is accessory dwelling units. And under SB 34, a couple of years ago, 82 cities had to update their moderate income housing components of their general plans. We supported that bill. We helped draft that bill. Uh, and all 82 cities are in compliance with that bill. And two thirds of them selected ADUs as an option. What Representative Ward's bill would do is say, if you've selected ADUs, then here are some new state standards, including that the city cannot regulate parking uh, for, for that ADU specifically above and beyond how they already regulate parking for a traditional single family home. And the pushback we've heard has been loud from cities who said, hey, we're in the best position to make decisions about neighborhoods and the impacts on neighborhoods. And so we share the goal of Representative Ward of having more ADUs, but we're concerned about state overreach uh, interfering with our ability to balance the needs of property owners and figure out what makes sense on the parking regulation side. There are other parts of his bill that are really terrific. He wants to set up a grant program to help owners convert their homes. He wants to simplify state code to make it easier for people to convert their homes uh, into owner-occupied ADUs. And so I, there's, still a lot of, there's still a lot of potential with this bill over the next, over the next eight weeks or so. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, Dave, if just one other quick thing. Just this applies to both uh, uh, this this bill we we're just talking about HB eighty two, and then some of these other ones. And it's, I think it's important that um, everyone always sort of remember that when we're dealing with land use and development and construction, these aren't short-term issues. These are long-term generational things. And so as we look at whether it's this bill or the one that deals with um, design requirements or whatever that's gonna be, our job in the city is to try to uh, make sure that these neighborhoods are good today and into the future. But if when we take, when uh, some of these authorities and, and uh, ability to regulate are taken away, you could have buildings that are eyesores for decades. Um, if any of you live in communities that have been around, you know, since the 50s or, or your neighborhoods were developed, then you probably have those houses where you're like, how is that allowed to be built without parking? Or why does that house, you know, always have, um, you know, maybe less desirable renters in it and it only has, you know, two windows on one wall? Or it's these very expensive things that if we let get sort of out of control and people push the limits and develop these things that are bad people can't afford to both fix them, you know, and build whatever they want next. And that's, so the projects that we allow to occur today without having that regulation on them are the things that we're going to have to fund to fix through redevelopment uh, agencies or something like that in the future. So it's not just about us saying that we, you know, don't want uh, to be preempted and our authority to go away, which is part of it, but it's also because there are these long-term views that sort of broad legislation doesn't always take into effect and can really have negative impacts on communities for, for decades or generations. So whether it's this bill or some of the other ones, that's another significant concern that we have because we deal with all the time situations where we have residents come in and say, what were you guys thinking when you allowed this to be built? And you know, it's negatively impacting our community. So it's all tied in with that. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. As we move along, 
and, and a lot of those comments can be can be uh, said again for House Bill 98, local building, local government building regulation, and, and Representative Ray is doing this bill, and it does it does a number of things that we're not particularly thrilled with. Uh, it it does it does uh, it 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 does it, it, it it supersedes. Uh, local de the design standards and materials and those sorts of things. But it also allows the developer to have their own plan review, have their own inspectors and, and uh, of, of what they're building. Uh, that's a problem, you know, because what, hap what, what that's doing is, is you're not having your independent licensed inspectors, you know, who, who, uh, who've gone through all the training and, and, ha and are licensed uh, under DOPL to do all your inspections. This could create a lot of building issues, not only for not only for uh, that that individual house, because who knows what what the homeowner is buying, because they won't know if the proper inspections were done. But also, if that's being done in multifamily situations, it could impact multiple families. So you know, we, that's a we believe that's a huge overreach on the local government, and that's one that you'll you'll hear a lot from us, and we do oppose that bill. Uh, going on to a couple of Senate bills, I'm going to turn the time over briefly to Cam on Senate Bill 13, Law Enforcement Internal Investigation Requirements. This is a bill that that uh, uh, we've worked out very, very uh, a long time with uh, together with Cam and the chiefs and the cities. But Cameron has been doing a lot of the negotiations with the Senate sponsor, Senator Iwamoto. Cam. Thank you. And this gets to what I referenced earlier this morning about the task force of police chiefs, mayors, council members, attorneys, and managers that have been providing a local perspective on, on bills that relate to trust in police and trying to find that space of, of supporting officers, but also finding areas of potential improvement. Uh, under current law, uh, let's say I'm an officer in Midvale City. And under current law, uh, there is a, an allegation of misconduct that's filed against me. Midvale City opens an internal investigation into my misconduct, and I leave to take a job in Butte City. Uh, you're welcome, Chris. So I, when I leave to go to Butte City, there are some gaps in current law about the communication between Midvale City and Butte City about my potential misconduct and those allegations of misconduct. What we have been trying to do with SB 13, and I think we're very close to it, is again, find the balance between upholding the due process rights of the officers, but also making sure that the police chief in Butte City is aware of those allegations against me in Midvale City, so that the Butte City can factor that into the decision-making process and if I am a quote unquote bad apple, ideally closing these communication gaps would preclude me from jumping agencies and avoiding investigations. Uh, likewise, we're trying to fill the gap in communication to post because there are certain, mis there are certain misconduct, there are certain types of misconduct that right now uh, get, are under post authority and certain ones that are just local policy and for potential allegations of misconduct that fall under post authority, we're trying to make sure there's an actual affirmative requirement in code to provide that information to post and provide that information to other agencies. Right now, the code is littered with mays. So you may share it upon request. We're going to be changing some of those to shall. So you shall share that information upon request. And we think Closing this communication gap will improve the community trust in officers. And this has actually been a major priority as we've talked to police officers that they don't want bad apples and bad pennies being passed around because of the integrity of the profession. So this is one that we think fits in that space of being a win-win. Representative Stoddard, to his credit, has been very involved in the dialogue this summer. There have been quite a few meetings with, that the Department of Public Safety has hosted. I know, Representative, you are also looking at this space. And so, I, you know, Senator Iwamoto's bill has been the focus of our task force for the last few weeks to try to get the language right. And it will be one of dozens of bills in this space in the upcoming session. So what you're saying is mine is going to fly under the radar since you haven't focused on it? 
Uh, I'm saying I don't have time to talk about all 79 bills <laughs> that impact public safety right now. So we picked one. So uh, no, nothing personal. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll take the anonymity. <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief Thomas, what's your perspective on that particular bill? I have to apologize. I walked out for just a brief minute, but I think I, I got the the uh, brief on towards the end of there. Uh, I don't think we're trying to hide anything. I think the more consistent we are across the state of Utah is uh, can only be seen as a positive. And I absolutely don't want to see where an officer may, you know, uh, be a significant uh, case of misconduct and perhaps walk away from the profession or from one agency and get hired on to another. Uh, as many of you know, right now we're literally across the state of Utah and even out of the state, we're in a uh, kind of a wage war. So we're stealing, you know, officers between agencies and they're, they're following the dollars. So uh, at the same time, as you get these lateral recruits, sometimes they're running from stuff. And that's something we don't want to do or see is where uh, there's misconduct and then they kind of clear the slate and slide on to the next agency. So I would support that. May I ask a question? So, you know, this already happens in education. When you're a teacher, you need to get fingerprinted and you actually are part of a statewide database. And we have red flags on our licenses on the state flag, I mean, on the state database. And teachers can actually, for an infraction of like hitting a kid or um, filing their um, book money wrong, they can get a red flag on their license. So teachers have been doing this for 20 years since I've been a teacher. So I don't, I don't understand why this isn't happening for police officers. And I, I don't understand what the pushback would be because teachers are already doing this. I can't go from one spot to the next without having somebody look at my license. So if a, is every Utah police officer a Utah peace officer? Are they all part of a database that is similar? And so I, I'm confused by, I, I, I don't wanna like be, um, inflammatory or minimalize it, but where are you doing this as teachers? So I don't understand why we're not doing this with police officers. So I support it, but I hope that there's um, uh, support in the police department as well. Yeah, I think what Cameron hit it on the head is when you put wording in that says may, it, it leaves too much discretion and a lot of uh, different issues. So, I mean, obviously there are, are significant misconducts that it shouldn't be may, it's will. And post is the the central data, database is a certifying agency for, you know, police powers and it's, it's a go-to. You know, Senator, I think that's a great question. And I, and I, and I, I know, you know, Ash and I also represent the police chiefs and, and it's a position of the executive board of the chiefs and the chiefs is that, you know, as we look at, as we look at this legislative session, we know that there are going to be calls for greater transparency, which we support. We know that there's a, you know, a call for, for, more, for better training, at the, which we support. And we, you know, we know there are certain issues that, that, that have to be taken care of. However, we wanna make sure that that delicate balance is still there. You know, uh, and, and, and those individual officers do have rights to a due process right. So we need to balance the individual officers due process rights with what's, what's important for the community and the transparency. And, 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 and you know, we can sit down and talk about what the balance is. But when you put it on paper, that's where that's where the rub comes. And, and Representative Stoddard has been great to work with, too, because he has a bill. So, I, you know, let me just say this. We are we want to do what's best for everyone. And we believe that by March 5th, we'll have that. This might you know, these a couple of these issues may be like making sausage. You don't want to see how it's done, but you'll love it at the end. And so that's what we're going to try to do. Um, the last bill that we want to talk about, we'll do this very briefly. It seems like every year or two, out the, the billboard companies want to continue to move the goalposts. And, and, and one year we, we feel like we have an agreement with the billboard companies. The next year they come back moving the goalposts. And they're doing that this year with Senate Bill 61. And Senator Sandal has a bill that will allow the billboard companies to, to make all of their paper billboards an electronic billboard without any city discussion. It's, it's the legislature will absolutely override all local zoning, all local controls, make that change regardless of what the city wants. Uh, and and, and, and we, believe, we believe that's inappropriate. 
You know, we, we've negotiated uh, electronic billboards in the past. You know, we've come to a conclusion and now the billboard companies want to move the goalposts and we're gonna have a problem with that. They're gonna have a second bill that's gonna come up that right now, if a billboard company has to relocate a billboard, they have, they, have, they have a mile within a mile to relocate it. We understand they could have another bill to change that to four miles. You know, we, we the billboard companies should not control local zoning. Ele local elected officials should control local zoning. So we'll, we we will oppose those those bills. Of course, we'll work with them because we always do. But what we don't want to get into is the situation every year where when you agree to a bill in 2019 and you think it's put to bed, and now in 2021, you bring it up again, you know, that's just really, that, that's really disheartening. If I could just uh, ask a comment, just for my own personal edification, I understand the concern about uh, <clears throat> moving the goalposts in terms of uh, a bill that may allow a billboard to be moved uh, a mile, four miles, whatever the distance may be. I understand that that's a zoning zoning issue. Help me to understand the uh, the the concern with transforming a paper billboard into an electronic billboard, and what what interest the city has in being a part of that decision making process. Just just for my benefit, Cameron, you look anxious. I'll let you take that one. <laughs> now, Representative Chris Sampson, thank you for the question. Uh, let, me, let me walk you through a potential fact pattern. When you look at, when you think about billboards, often what immediately comes to mind are billboards off of I-15, right? Uh, we have kind of a billboard corridor. Well, when you think about Midvale City, Midvale City has a lot of neighborhoods that buttress I-15, and there are billboards that currently tower right above those right above those homes. So the city, as part of their land use authority, has to find has to strike that balance between respecting the property rights of the billboard owner, but also respecting the property rights of the individuals who live beneath that sign. And so if it's a paper sign and the light is illuminated and the light points up there's still some impact on those neighbors. But if that sign were to be converted by right to be an electronic billboard, all of a sudden you have this massive television screen that is going to be beaming down on those neighbors and on those property owners. And guess who they're going to call? Yep, exactly. They're gonna call City Hall to say, we can't sleep because of the brightness of this billboard and this is impacting our our enjoyment of our property. And so the, the city needs to be able to have that right, needs to be able to balance those property rights and a state preemption would force, would force Mayor Hale to say, I'm sorry, neighbors, there's nothing we can do because the state has handcuffed us. Thank you, that helps. I think, what the, just, are, I think what the cities are looking for is yeah. the ability to have those discussions, right? I mean, there should be a discussion about what billboards can and cannot do and the city should be a part of that. What, what the bill would do would completely remove the city from those discussions. Your hands are tied, you are no longer part of those discussions because the state will just allow, you know, the billboards to have full right to what they can and cannot do. That's the concern. The, the, uh, and let me just add to this, Representative Christiansen, that's a great question. Is Cameron talked about the, the, the billboards on the interstate. A lot of billboards are in residential neighborhoods anyway. You know, uh, and, and so what happens is, is those billboards in residential neighborhoods are, are going to have a, a huge impact on those neighbors. And, and, and for the city not to have a say in that really is, is from my view, is unconscionable. Uh, and then we have cities who have ordinance, that, the cities that have ordinances that do not allow any new billboards. When you go from a paper to, a, to, a, to an electronic, it's essentially a new billboard. So what the state legislature is doing is overriding those ordinances that cities have done, where the cities have, 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 have put together that, that now are, are, are shot. You know, for example, Holiday, uh, back in, uh, when they became a city, enacted an ordinance, no new billboards. We've gone through all the minutes. Billboard companies did not object to that. Now, essentially, they're going to go, the, these same companies are going to the legislature to say, even though we didn't object to holidays, no new, or, no new billboards, 
we're now going to have new billboards in holiday. You know, that, that's an overreach that we don't think is appropriate. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think we're done on the issues and we have about 10 minutes. So however you want to use the next 10 minutes would be great. I want to ask Kane if you would like to uh, jump in and, and uh, supply your information and then we'll go to the legislators. I just noticed I got the sun shining through my window. You probably can't see me now. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mayor. Uh, just uh, just wanted to tell legislators how uh, much appreciate, appreciated it is for us to spend the time with you this morning. And uh, we, we owe you a breakfast uh, at our famed Bohemian restaurant. Uh, it, we, will, we will definitely make sure that we come uh, invite you to one. Uh, and I would like to do it even before uh, this time next year. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the relationship that we have with you is extremely important uh, to us. Uh, as you've heard today, we, we have, we're a, we're a small city, but we're in this big metropolis in the middle of the Salt Lake Valley. In fact, we're in the middle of the Wasatch Front. And so Midvale is aptly named. Um, and, and we have big city problems. Uh, right along, I, we have the same problems that Salt Lake City does in Midvale. And, uh, you know, we, we have uh, a difficulty dealing with those, uh, with, with funding issues and those kind of things. And so any help that, that uh, you can give us through the legislator, uh, the legislature is, is greatly appreciated. Um, it, you know, our, our life's blood is our 7200 South Corridor that connects uh, both the Bingham Junction area and the, the shop at Fort Union. And unless we have that in control and in, uh, is conducive to business, uh, it, it is a detriment to, to keeping our city afloat. And so it, that's why we put such an emphasis on law enforcement. Uh, get, really appreciate the, the job that our special unit is doing that's funded through our, through our uh, homeless funding. Uh, our nine officer unit does a fantastic job of keeping things under control. And without that unit, uh, frankly, I don't know uh, how, we would, how we would manage other than we would have to pull our officers out of the neighborhood. Um, but we really appreciate, and you will be hearing from us uh, through the legislative session. Uh, we, we work hand in hand with the League of Cities and Towns. Uh, we attend uh, the, the legislative policy committee meeting and and the other uh, meetings with the league. And uh, so we're, we're in lockstep with the League of Cities and Towns on the issues. And we really, again, appreciate uh, your time this morning. And Mayor, I would uh, open it back up to the, uh, to the legislators for any questions. Okay, um, I have an order here that I, on, on my agenda. And so I would like to ask Senator Kathleen Reby if you have issues that have not been addressed yet or concerns, uh, the microphone is yours. Please feel free to bring up anything you would like. Um, I have a bill outstanding. It's a, a Senate Bill 70 and it's going to be a mobile crisis intervention expansion. And um, I'm hoping that this will alleviate some of the um, more, more, I don't know how to phrase it. I'm, I'm going to say more problematic calls that involve mental health issues, physical issues, mental uh, health issues, and then also police issues, where we would be providing a longer term solution for some of these, these people that are in mental health crisis. So that bill, I think, would be helpful with some of the homeless conversation we've had. Um, I think that Midvale does a tremendous job. I've enjoyed my relationship with you guys and um, I'm hoping to come to your meetings in person soon. Um, and thanks for all you do. I really appreciate the work that's been done in your community. And um, Midvale Elementary School has done a tremendous job turning around their school, which is such a credit to our community, isn't it? Uh, I was out there the other day and uh, it's just a beautiful school. You can feel the community feel when you're walking around it. So. Um, just kudos to you guys. It's awesome. Thank you, Senator. Good to have you with us this morning. Representative Elison, do you have further? Is, is he still on with us? I think Steve had to leave. He told me that yeah. he had, uh, he sent me his calendar. He had three different meetings and he wanted to make sure he got us, he got with us for a bit. So I think he's gone, Mayor. Okay. 
then uh, we'll ask uh, Representative Andrew Stoddard. Other issues that you'd like to see addressed or comments upon this morning, anything uh, of content or question? No, I just wanna thank you for hosting this. I will uh, follow up with my city council member and tell him he owes me a breakfast. <laughs> I, we ought to offer rain checks if we just had rain. Uh, maybe <laughs> we ought to offer a dry January check that uh, is good for one year for breakfast, right, Kane? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Representative Stoddard. Uh, Thanks, Representative I, snow. I want a snow check. I don't want any rain. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> Representative Steve Christiansen, please. Anything you'd like to add, questions you have? Mayor and others, thank you for this morning. It's been fantastic and always attending these meetings are just so informational and, and helpful. I don't have anything else to add other than, again, just, just thank you. I've enjoyed reading your book. Thank you for that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have that on my bookshelf. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll now move to our most junior representative, Galen Benyon. Anything you'd like to add, questions, comments? I just want to thank all of you. Um, I will be on the political subdivisions committee. And so I was very glad I could attend the holiday meeting and hear about some of these bills and hear about more of them here today. And like many of these representatives, I was at our Canyons Education Association meeting yesterday. And the work that Hillcrest and Midvale Elementary have done is great. And um, I, I knocked doors all through my district. So I've been through the Midvale area twice and um, that is part of our district. And I think it's a wonderful area and I'm glad for the many things that you're doing for our homeless and um, for your city in general. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Benyon. Good to have all of you with us this morning. Uh, city Councilman Sperry, do you have any questions that you'd like to bring up that didn't get addressed sufficiently? He's... I don't, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Quinn. All right. Open season. Anybody else? Anything left undone? We sure appreciate all of your attendance. Uh, this has been good. Kane, do you want to wrap up anything or Dave or Ashley Spatafor? We're, any? We will definitely send you those uh, breakfast IOUs out uh, this week. Uh, so we will, we will make good on the, on the breakfast promise. <laughs> But we've got to find a way to do it together. So yes, we will. <laughs> well, my after 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 you all get your shots, then we'll we'll do this. <laughs> my wife has been on the computer to my side, getting us an appointment for our uh, vaccinations sometime next week. So I hope all of you uh, will soon have your opportunity to get that shot, and we can meet together without fear. All right, without anything else then, uh, I'm going to call this meeting adjourned and we'll uh, have a breakfast sometime in the near future. And we'll see you again for sure about this time next year. Happy legislature to everybody.